Today, Sophia is going to be presenting again, and she's going to be talking about the Theotokos, the life and in, in history, career, career of the Theotokos. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, today being the, the day before, um, before Clean Monday, Lent begins, it's such a pleasure for me to be able to give this talk on my favorite subject the Panagia. And as we know, Father just announced that we will be celebrating the Akathistos Imnos. This uh, figures very importantly into our lives. Um, and it takes five weeks of ceaseless prayer. We come every Friday um, that leads us finally to Holy Week. And it's not a celebration in the common sense of that word, but it's an intricate and rich part of being an Orthodox Christian. And of course, we know the history and the background of the Akathistos. The year was 626 in Constantinople. The city is being besieged by the enemy, the Avars. The emperor and the holy fathers in the church of the Theotokos prayed unceasingly to our holy mother to protect them from the enemy. They held up a banner, and I was looking at the banner at the back of the, um, of the altar, uh, and I was hoping that the curtain could stay open, but I think you all know which, which I'm talking about. It's a huge banner, and it has the Virgin Mary. Ours, in particular, has the Annunciation, which we know we um, honor and celebrate during uh, Lent. So 626, if you can do the math in your head, which I can't, so I figured it out, that was 1,395 years ago. So we've been celebrating this. It's not in the Bible. We're reenacting it. And it was so long ago, reminding us that the Panagia, the Theotokos, protects us. It's a tradition. It's not in the Bible. And for some people, that shouldn't be part of what we do. But it's essential because it's our history. And that's mostly what I want to talk about today. There's a term that if we were in our classroom, I would have written it on the board, <clears throat> and I would have <clears throat> given you this definition. It's syncretism. And what that means is that uh, it's the process of combining different beliefs while blending practices of various schools of thought, merging or assimilating severe, originally discrete traditions. And so what I'm about to talk about is going to syncretize what Hellenes did in their pagan past. I don't like the word pagan because it brings up connotations that I don't necessarily like. As an, <clears throat> excuse me, as an art historian, I've always enjoyed looking at art, engaging with it, analyzing it, and writing about it, and talking about it. <clears throat> I don't know where my water went. <clears throat> and we certainly have a body of art in the Orthodox Church. But I always held church art to be sacred, something that is special, not the stuff you see in, in books, um, maybe untouchable. I always thought it was separate from the great works of, say, the Renaissance, the Baroque, uh, the Impressionists, and so on. What I understood of medieval and Byzantine art from generic art history books was that it was static. It was old. It was the same over and over and over again. The Virgin Mary and the saints all looked the same. In fact, the Theotokos is always wearing red and blue, almost. <clears throat> what was even worse for art historians is they like to talk about people who create art, and none of the artists in antiquity were known. 
And why was that? Maybe we'll ask that question um, later. So the icons, as works of art, were left on the side. But somewhere along the path of my academic studies, I found, <clears throat> I found out that there were others, other people like me, uh, who found in orthodox icons not only spiritual beauty in sacred art, but also profound beauty of the worldly, physical, aesthetic sense. So we have hundreds, maybe thousands, of various images of her. Um, and we have a few um, right here. So ideally, these would be up on a big screen. <clears throat> I'm sorry about my voice, but it goes with my allergies. The oldest visual image of the Theotokos is believed to have been painted by the hand of none other than the, Luke, the evangelist. He was a physician. There's another whole disagreement about was he Jewish or was he a Gentile, another term that I don't really care for. Um, that might be a topic for another time. So historically, we believe that there were six of these images that painted by Luke of Panagia. And this one right here is very much like that icon. Uh, because why Luke lived in the, the, first, uh, the first century uh, and into the second century. Uh, he wrote the Gospels. It's debated whether he actually knew Jesus Christ personally or in a kind of second-hand way. Pardon? This one. <clears throat> so this one resided in one of the great venerable Byzantine churches, monasteries, public buildings in Constantinople. Now, why do I mention it was all in all of those buildings? Because she moved around. So I'm trying to establish that we humans, in our devotion to Panagia, have given her a life. And we've given her assignments, like a job description. I originally thought of this presentation being Panagia's job description. So there it was. We don't know what happened to the other five, but there was one until 1204. So what happened in that year? The Fourth Crusade happened. The Venetians had become so gross, gross, grotesquely wealthy and powerful during the First, Second, and Third Crusades. By the Fourth Crusade, under the pretense of rescuing their Byzantine brethren, the powerful Venetians who had become the rulers of the sea decided that it was in their best interest to rescue the treasures of the great city from the potential danger and destruction at the hands of the infidels. And because Father reminded us today is Forgiveness Sunday, I'm omitting a couple of lines that I would have said. <laughs> Dozens of ships, this is just fact, were loaded with sculptures, <clears throat> gem-encrusted gospel books, Bibles, carved ivory crosses, precious icons of various saints, clerical robes of the finest silk. Remember, in Constantinople at that time uh, was well known for its uh, silk weaving, and it was a required stop along the silk road going both east and west. All of it hauled off to Venice. Oh, and I forgot to mention the horses, the four bronze horses that occasionally you'll see on top of the uh, portico of um, St. Mark's Church. But that's a topic for another time. We're interested in the Theotokos in Venice, our Theotokos. In a new place, new artists were about to give her new lives. Artists were destined to paint her in various scenes that were described and revealed in the New Testament. We call these narratives, like the Nativity, the Annunciation, where she's doing some kind of action. But wait, um, images of her had already been painted or rendered in mosaics. Maybe if I hold it, which I don't like to do. In fact, those nameless painters in mosaics, is this better? Um, almost uniformly followed the painter's manual. I have a copy of it right here. 
this uh, book, it's the painter's manual of, of, we, we don't know why of is being used. He didn't write it. He compiled it. And he is from a place called Forna in Greece. Anybody know where that is? Kiria Yorgia, maybe you know where that is? Furna. Yes, well, I have a little bit of information. It's a village in central Greece. When I looked for it on the map, if you take a straight line from Nafpaktos and from Patra and you line them straight up where they meet, will be right up there. It's a village today, according to the um, 2011 uh, census, there's between 650 and uh, 750 people. And this Dionos, Dionysios was from that location. And there's, uh, in trying to get all my facts together, I learned a ton of more information about this place, going back to the um, icon of Panagia by St. Luke, it's believed that there is a one there, that they rescued it, and they left Bursa in Asia Minor, uh, pronounced uh, in Greek, it's Prusa, and they took it to this uh, obscure monastery. It's very mountainous. No tourists go there, I guarantee you, so I had a hard time finding information about it. The nearest city that you can look up on a map is Evritania. Um, and we'll maybe ask, uh, ask some questions about that later. But let's pause for a moment and contemplate that icon that we're talking about um, that went on its journey uh, prior to uh, 1204. What purpose did she serve? And what did she look like? We have these likenesses that... Uh, we believe come close to it, um, but we can right at this point we can talk about our two platiteras because they're very visible to us. And so, on the one hand, as I mentioned, that Byzantine um, Christian icons uh, were not considered art because they were static and they were the same. I want to point out to you that they, there is there are variations. If we look at our platitera, and I guess I can turn around. She's generally uh, depicted with Christ. Uh, in our case, uh, he's in the medallion in the new Platitera. He presents himself in, um, in a medallion. In some obscure Russian um, icons, he actually looks like it, we're looking at an embryo of him inside Panagia's body. That's another interesting one. So she always has her hands, or often has her hands, outstretched in the oran's position. Now, if you'll notice, her hands are, her palms are open. And I'm going to talk about that space between her thumb and the rest of her fingers. Our original platitera doesn't have her arms outstretched. So those iconographers were taking some individual liberties. We don't know who they were. In our case, we do know the artist, but in, back in the day, we didn't. And she's holding, he's almost like floating. So if we think about icons as not being um, pictures, nor are they trying to be abstract and show figures floating um, arbitrarily, there's a purpose for it. There's a purpose for everything. <clears throat> but we can imagine these grand processions. That's why I wanted that banner to be out, because um, we do take the banner out, we take our epitaphio out. We're used to doing processions, because that's also part of our tradition. So the emperor was always involved in Constantinople, especially when we go back to Justinian. They established these processions public displays of people to come in because they were um, all through the first 800 years of Christianity um, were proselytizing. It didn't end with the apostles. And um, Justinian figures very importantly in this time period. I'm, I don't like dates myself, but I have to give you a few. So Justinian was in the 6th century. 
the church that he built, and uh, the most famous, he also built a lot of other ones, is always in the news lately. Um, and his, um, he, his, his, he wasn't only building in Constantinople and in the area that became uh, Asia Minor and Byzantium. He was across the Adriatic Sea because the Christian church, the seat of power, was officially moved with Constantine, um, but never left Rome. And to try and talk about the six patriarchates is a little too complicated, so I'm going to just focus on what happens um, in Justinian's time. Um, so we can go to Ravenna or Sicily, and we can also go to Venice, Venice as I mentioned. Just a side note is about five years after Hagia Sophia was completed in 537, a terrible plague hit Constantinople and all the areas around. Uh, and it lasted until 549. It lasted eight years. I wanted to mention that just because that's what we're doing right now. And we can see that they came out of it quite well. And this was the same bacteria, not a virus. This was a bacteria that was eventually going to cause the Great Plague to cross over into um, Italy about 300 years later. <clears throat> At that time, um, Father mentioned to me another miracle similar to the Panagia and the Akathistos that the bishops and the emperor and all the monks were chanting and singing. They were in their prayer. They created all of the words that we experience and repeat and relive in the Akathistos, because they were walking, they were praying unceasingly for the enemy to go away. And Father um, Jim reminded me of another miracle that's attributed about uh, in the 800s during iconoclasm, <clears throat> when Constantinople was being invaded at, again by a different group of people, the Rus, the people who eventually became the Russians. Um, and just simply, what happened here was that they prayed. It was uh, St. Photios, and we know our St. Photios, who was the archbishop at the time, and the emperor took the maphorion. We see Panagia wearing this robe, um, and she also wore a belt inside, which we can't see her inner garment. She wore a belt, and... Um, I'll talk about that more in a, in a minute. <clears throat> but the Russians were coming by sea. And uh, Photios um, thought, what can we do? Let's, the, they're coming by sea. Let's take that robe and dip it into the water. And what happened was this great uh, tremor of waves happened and a huge storm uh, arose volumes of water, and the enemy fled. Uh, they were eventually going to come back, and they're going to say, you know, we love everything you're doing here in Constantinople. We want a part of it. We want you to send us people to teach us the beautiful uh, religion that you have, the economy that you have, and so on and so forth. And by the ninth century, uh, Russia would become completely um, Orthodox Christian. Let's talk about that icon back in Venice now. What happens to it? How many of you have been to Venice? Anybody been to Venice? Did you see the icon of St. Luke? No? That's because it's not always been on display. Because those Venetians knew they didn't want to put that on display because something might happen to it. So most tourists who go to the cathedral don't even realize the life and career of that icon. Um, but we're, we're here... This, well, um, it's probably that original, the one you had in your hand. So if you ever go to St. Mark's, you come in, have your coffee and your goodies, and come into St. Mark's, just like we are right here, and you walk into the church, you'll see a huge altar, and there is a, a replica of the icon, and there's um, statues and sculptures all over the place. That original Panagia from, that was stolen in 1204 
is going to be in the same position as our original Panagia. So there's a special little chapel, and you can go in there and you can venerate it. <clears throat> so I mentioned before that um, it took me a long time to give myself permission to examine icons as works of art, right? Well, prior to that, I had been uh, studying ancient Greek art, vases, mosaics, paintings, and so on. Um, so I seem to kind of hover around those, that thousand year period, 500 BC before the Common Era, and uh, 500 in the Common Era. So transitional time periods are the richest because we can see the past while the future is taking shape. So in 1992, I had the good fortune to meet Jennifer Niels, an archaeologist, very prominent archaeologist of Greek archaeology, who had been invited to the Tampa Museum of Art to discuss her new book, Goddess and Polis, meaning city. So one artifact in the existing collection uh, shows a funeral marker, and I'm not sure that we have a picture of that, but it's simply uh, sort of a, a pointed top and a rectangle, and the statue, the figure of a woman, and she's not described uh, whether she was a Christian or... Um, or a Greek pagan, um, but this was found in Thessaly, Thessaly, up in central, the same place that our little monastery is. And these were given to, these works were given, donated permanently to the Tampa Museum of Art and another part of the collection by Mr. Gus Lemonopoulos, who I just found out uh, passed away in uh, 2005, I believe it was. So Dr. Neal's research concerned the Pan-Athenaic Festival, which was held every four years in Athens. And this is what intrigued me. She described the festival devoted to Athena, and we already knew Athena's attributes. She was the promachos, the champion or leader of war. Um, she was the parthenos, of course, uh, Athena the maiden, the virgin, there's a side story that we'll talk about another time that Athena became a foster mother. Um, but we'll, again, we'll talk about that the, another time. So Athena was also known as Athena Niki for victory because she shared the qualities with um, the deity, deity, Niki. And that's where we get, she gets the epithet, Athena Niki. She has another epithet called Athena Ergani because she was the patron of crafts and craft workers. Uh, this did not only include traditional feminine crafts, such as weaving, but also many of the more industrial ones like metalworking and pottery. And then there was Athena Polias, patron and guardian of Athens. This epithet identified her with both philosophy and intellectual traditions of Athens. So now let's think about what life was like in Athens, say in the first 200 years of this common era. We know what it was like because in the first 200 years, towards the end of that period, uh, we have the world's first tour guide, and that's Pausanias, also a historian, but uh, Rick Steves, if you are familiar with Rick Steves, will tell you that's where he got most of his ideas from wandering the world and documenting it. So you can read about this in Book 1, uh, Chapters 17 and 29. He describes festivals, athletic competitions, poetry and drama, and essential for our purposes, celebrated the Pan-Athenaic procession of the peplos. Um, do we have that picture, Melissa? Well, here. Here's one. Maybe I can just hold it up. This is, let me do it this way. This is Athena, and probably looks familiar to us because we see her. Uh, the peplos is really a chemise. Oops, wait, okay. It's a chemise, and it's tied with a belt or a zoni. Um... Is another part I have to skip because it's Forgiveness Sunday. So the Panathenaic procession of the Peplos reveals the activities of the Arephoria, 
These were young girls between the ages of 7 and 11 years old, usually the daughters of wealthy and powerful Athenians, because it was an honor for them to serve the Temple of Athena, who would dedicate a year of their lives to weaving the most fine and delicate cloth to dress the statue of Athena. This is what Pausanias would have um, witnessed because he wrote about it. Huge crowds were gathered around. Solemn prayers were, were being recited by priestesses and priests of the Temple of Athena. In t- incense was burning, wafting its fragrance among the crowds. Does any of this sound kind of familiar to practices that we do today? Uh, saying prayers, solemn processions, and incense wafting in the air. And elegant poetry was being recited. And then comes the procession. Everything goes quiet. Each one of these young girls, I think I have another one, maybe these two, Melissa. One is perpendicular and one is horizontal. So a dozen of these young girls were marching proudly, carrying their bundles of delicately woven uh, textiles, and we'll get that picture up in a minute. So Athena's garment that we see her wearing is the peplos. It's a kind of a chemise gathered with a zoni or a belt. So I had been studying these sculptures and reading plays and myths about Athena, how she helped Hercules. That was another one of her attributes. She helped warriors. And so I think we're going to, I'm going to try and make a case for when um, when um, Constantinople was under siege in 626, um, there were warriors who were out there defending the walls, and this is where Panagia was, doing exactly the same kind of work uh, that the goddess Athena did. So I think you can, I hope you can see here, uh, these are just drawings and sketches of, I'm sorry? But what we see here is the actual frieze. Um, The frieze is the uh, program of uh, sculptures in low relief, low and high relief in this case. And you can see that here is um, an older woman, and here is a younger girl presenting her bundle. Now, I couldn't find enough pictures of this. Um, And we, we know something else about the Parthenon frieze, and that's the topic that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, some marbles that live in a different country right now. But, and we tend to forget that these uh, sculptures dedicated to Athena are still there. And we can go up there and we can appreciate them. Some are still in place and some are in the museum across the street. So I kind of had an epiphany. Um, so when we recall those early Byzantine icons of the Virgin Mary when the angel Gabriel um, appears to her, the earliest primitive ones, and I was looking for one that had um, Mary with the spindle. Yes, thank you. This is a great assistant. So what was Mary doing? This was part of her career. What was she doing when Gabriel appeared to her? Well, we know that there were two appearances. The first one was when she was by the well. And she was terrified, and she ran home, locked the door. But locked doors don't affect angels. Um, So I have found that there are some icons of the Virgin Mary at the well when Gabriel appears. But the one that's essential to us, and I wish the doors, the curtain was open, and I don't know if I have permission to open that. But it's the Annunciation, simply the Annunciation. Mary had been depicted doing the same work that Athena had been doing. Remember, she was the patron saint of weaving. And there's another story when she lost her temper with one of the women who was weaving who tried to outdo her. But that's not a good thing, and I'm sure Athena would have forgiven her. So what we see is that we're combining the different beliefs while blending the practices of various schools of thought. This is syncretism. Uh, 
The earliest iconographers and artists placed her in scenes doing what an average young woman of her time, Jewish or Gentile, any woman, as we understand life in antiquity, would be weaving. She was responsible for weaving all of the cloth uh, for her family. Um, and another little side note, we might think, God, glad I don't have to do that anymore. Um, but up until a few years ago, um, American girls, European girls, um, it was a tradition for a girl and her aunts and her sisters and her mothers and grand and other women in her life would help a young woman put together her trousseau. Um, in modern times, we sort of just kind of do a little token and we have um, what is called a personal shower and then there might be another kind of shower. Those kind of wedding preparations were a carryover from what women had to essentially do. She wasn't going to go into a marriage and set up a household if she didn't have sheets and towels and blankets and baby clothes because that was going to happen and whatever else it needed and clothing for her husband. Um, and even to this day, young girls in Greece and maybe other countries, I think in Italy and France, have the opportunity to learn these traditional crafts. But these ideas didn't come from Luke because we have Luke just painting a portrait of the Virgin Mary. Now, again, this is up for, up for argument that he may have painted a picture of her with uh, the infant Jesus. Um, so we can either accept it's the icon of um, Panagia alone, solo, or Panagia with her son. So if the succeeding artists were free to embellish images of the Virgin in her worldly activity, suppose we go back to see where those ideas may have come from. Pausanias was there. And remember, in the Hellenistic world that Jesus was born into, there would have been temples everywhere dedicated to Athena, Artemis, I should say Athena Minerva in Rome, Artemis Diana in Rome, and Aphrodite Venus. And this isn't part of this talk, but I also am trying to make a case for not only Athena being an antecedent of the Virgin Mary, but also Artemis and Aphrodite. Um, so it's not too big of a stretch to conclude that the ritual of the peplos information about the Virgin Mary came from those ancient images, the peplos. Christians didn't care anything about a peplos. They were probably wearing the same kind of robes, but that did not occur to them until um, in this overlap period when Christianity was in Athens and all over um, Asia Minor and all over the uh, edges of the Mediterranean, people still would have been carrying on the, uh, the Panathenaic Peplos procession. Uh, Pausanias, I said, lived at the end of the second century, and this is what he was telling us. So the Christians who were there people who were being converted to Christianity, because remember, Paul went there, he went to Corinth, he went to several other, Philippi, several places in Greece, Thessaloniki, the biggest part of the, um, the New Testament, 13 books of the New Testament were written by Paul on his missionary journeys. So it's almost too simple to recall, to think about the Parthenon just standing there, in the second century, devoted to the virgin goddess, who was the patron of the city, who was the patron of the arts, who um, defended warriors, who uh, advocated for justice. And here were the Christians with their newly developing understanding of Panagia, of Theotokos. They hadn't even given her that name yet. That was to come later on. So we have... Um, uh, something that I wanted to, uh, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. In, um, I think it was the late 1980s, when I was um, visiting my sister-in-law in the Patician neighborhood of Athens, and she said, let's go to church. And I went to the church just two blocks away from her house, and it was called Panagia Zoni, 
which I had never heard of before, but there's a lot that I haven't heard of before. And so what I saw was, maybe we'll look at some of these. I'm sorry, Melissa. I wanted to give you this one. Something like this. So you remember when I mentioned the Panagia Orans? With her hands wide open, palms up. Um, here is the icon of that event. Now whether that occurred as a result of Photios in the middle eight, late 800s, the Patriarch of Rome and of Constantinople, I'm sorry, um, and the emperor dipping that cloth that was the robe of the Virgin Mary into the water, there might be some kind of connection. But in this church, it, it, in addition, the zoni was a long strip of a s fabric, a sash, maybe a different color. We can imagine all kinds of things. That what also came along with that robe but at some points, it was cut into little pieces so that it could go out to Alexandria and Africa and Egypt and all the other places, um, in maybe even to Jerusalem. So it had been cut up in little pieces. And there was a little box on a little table at the side of the altar that in this little church in Patision in Athens uh, contained a piece of that zoni. And to me, that's a direct connection and relationship to the weavers, the women, the work of Panagia, and also a complement to the uh, uh, iconographers who decided to paint this image. And that's why I can see, I mean, I'm imagining it, I'm hoping that you can imagine, that this platitera could easily have that zoni draped uh, from one hand to the other. So in the process, I have studied all of these um, images, and I have also um, cut out a lot of my text because I wasn't, it wasn't going to be a bad talk, uh, but it, uh, I think I've, I hope I've made my point that the attributes of the goddess Athena, uh, aided by this process of syncretism, uh, became the attributes that over the centuries, not all at once, took about 800 years, we could say, before some of these Athena attributes were applied uh, to the Virgin Mary. And I think we are the, the fortunate um, um, uh, inheritors of that um, tradition. questions. Last time it was very, very echoey, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and do it in a way that's less echoey, so we'll see if it works. But anyway, so questions from in the room, questions from online, and I'll try to manage the questions from online. So if you guys I, I have to give a, a real big applaud, thanks to Andy, who's just done such a wonderful job. Uh, I go home and listen to and watch He's doing a fantastic job. I mean, you know, ideally, those of you who have come to seminar, you know that we're in our classroom. We can do it a completely different way. Melissa has been a genius with coming up with all of these different ideas. And um, is it next week or next month that we're having uh, Liz's talk? Next month, yes, because oratorical is happening. So I hope I've given you something to think about because that's what our seminars are for. The seminars, being in a small room, are set up for the purpose of give and take. Um, and I've tried to organize this as a body of information that I'm giving to you, but also hopefully um, uh, raising questions in your minds. And Catherine.
Well, that's, that's a good point. Um, the, the iconographers had liberties. Even though this book is huge, I would love to, in class I would pass it around. It gives precise details of how Mary is to look, how um, St. Athanasius is supposed is it, the shape of his beard. The beards had two points, one point, 12 points, no beard. There were all these specific restrictions. As for this um, adult, well, he doesn't look like an adult. He looks sort of adolescent. He's a teenager. He's probably, he's probably 11 or 12 just before he started growing a beard, I think. Um, but that's a, that's a good question. So all I can say about that is that the um, iconographers were making decisions as they go along. Um, we know that we know that Jesus grew up, and maybe this um, uh, particular iconographer decided to um, at, we, the same iconographer, by the way, right? Um, I forget his name. I'm embarrassed to say I forget his name. But there are models. There are models that he would have been copying from. And um, it's, it's, I really don't have an answer to the question except saying that it was one of the variations. Well, that's, a good, that's an excellent question. The Armenians officially um, kind of stalled right there at iconoclasm because they, they did not believe um, that images should be allowed because they, were, they understood them to be graven images. And we don't have... Graven, to me, is something that's sculpted, uh, multidimensional. But remember when I said it was in the late... 860s or 870s when Photios was the um, was the patriarch and there were a series of emperors but Leo III was one of them when iconoclasm started there was this movement um, that suddenly uh, Christians had this, uh, Eastern Christians really because it was the Eastern Christians who were into these sacred images Back over here in Rome, they started drawing fancy narratives and uh, going with sort of going with the flow and making actually pretty pictures that the art historians like to look at. They didn't care for these static, kind of repetitive things. But the Russians who invaded and Photios dipped the robe of the Virgin in and stirred the waters and all the ships crashed and the Russians left. Well, they came back. Um, this is very well known. There was a, an emperor, um, Vladimir, and he had been coming and going. Remember, Constantinople was on that Silk Road. And they had been coming and going, and they saw this city. It was so splendid. They had never seen anything like it. And there were, I don't know much about the pre-Christian religion, but Cyril and Methodius were sent from Constantine, uh, sent from Constantinople um, to proselytize, to teach, to, they took some monks and they taught them the Greek language, which eventually became, um, it was actually the Greek language uh, syncretized with Slavonic, which was kind of a very primitive language, hadn't had a body of literature, no histories were written in that language. But Cyril and Methodius took that to Russia. So we can say about Russia and all of the Balkan uh, countries, Bulgaria, Serbia, they all adopted and follow, their icon painters follow the same rules and regulations. It, many years ago, well, maybe 10 years ago, in... Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The question was that Catherine asked was, do um, other Orthodox Christians, such as the Armenians, the Russians, um, the Syrians, all of Romanians, do they follow this program of iconography? And the answer is yes, they do. Um, in fact, 
a few years ago at the festival in Tampa, there was a young woman, a nun from Romania, who was, had her icons for sale. And uh, I had a chance to talk to her. Her English was very good. And she has been given permission to travel all over the United States. She may go to other English-speaking countries as well um, to talk about her, her work and the other nuns at her monastery who paint icons. And to me, they look just like our Byzantine icons, things that we would see in our, um, our little bookstore that we would see in churches um, in the United States. So, yes, they do. They do. Uh-huh. That's right. That's right. So, um, you know, this is kind of sketchy, and um, I was not too sure how it was going to go, but I became more and more convinced that I could show the relationship, the um, attributes of goddess Athena, um, right there in the year 200, when Hadrian was in Athens, the, the old ways, the pagan religions hadn't died. In fact, for about 300 years, Christians were going in and um, uh, taking over abandoned temples, uh, splashing them with uh, holy water, and holding services in them. It's, it's easier said than done because we look at a rectangular building when we see a temple. But those ancient temples were not intended for congregation. They may have even, the Parthenon may have only held about 50 to 100 people. They were, there was a big empty room called a cella. And at the end of the cella was another little room where the, where the money was kept because the um, ancient um, temples, um, always, people always donated money to them. So they were like little treasuries. We, uh, it's fun to go to Delphi because the Temple of Apollo was one of the, was like the Bank of America. You know, it had so much money down in a vault underneath. That's, that's an excellent question. Georgia asked, um, was the purpose of my talk the icons of the Virgin Mary or her life? I, I hope that I was a little bit effective in making that point because I wanted to look at the icons from the very first one by Luke that kind of gave us an idea. And that's the prototype. And after that... We started adding, I say we, the tradition of iconographers, starting added on, adding on, you know, her robe, um, taking that connection from Athena, uh, the goddess, with her zoni, and this sacred object, you know, physical thing, and bringing in the tradition of the, the young girls who were weaving this took a, a year of their lives, like sort of an apprentice. But it was an honor that they took with them uh, for the rest of their lives. And we can go over into Rome because a tradition there started with another a deity, with another goddess, Hestia, in, um, in Greece, um, who was a virgin uh, and very closely allied with, um, with Athena. And they established the cult of the Vestal Virgins. Now, that was a little more dramatic because these were eight-year-old girls who were, again, from wealthy families, who would dedicate their lives at the Temple of Vesta. And that meant that they would tend the, um, the uh, clean it up and greet visitors, give them refreshments and so on. And they, had to, they were obliged to stay in this service for 30 years. And at the end of 30 years, they were able to be free. They got a stipend. They got servants. They got a house. And it was very beneficial for them. The only, only drawback was that if they transgressed, they had to remain virgins. If they transgressed, uh, they were put buried alive. And there are stories of that happening. And that was...
They used their imaginations. Yeah, they did. Now, there, you know, there are limits. I, um, and this is something I would have to research a little bit more, but there are limits. Just like we can't invent a new prayer um, or, you know, change anything in the liturgy. Um, but there have, there, uh, there's a body of, of uh, hierarchs who would oversee uh, anybody who, I mean, for example, you couldn't, um, you couldn't, like, take um, St. Catherine. Okay, she died a horrible, terrible death. Uh, somebody could put in her painting, like, a Roman soldier or somebody in the background or an image of the devil. See, those things don't happen. There are incidents where they did happen um, by some more... Uh, recent painters uh, who were monks who were confined in their um, in their cells at their monasteries and their minds would go when they start reading about you know all the suffering and the pain and torture and maybe a little bit of this kind of activity that was going on in Spain in the 1500s with the uh, Inquisition and the horrible tortures that Christians who made a mistake were punished with and that's another whole whole topic I want to talk about someday, the, the physical harm and punishment that Christian leaders perpetrated on believers. Is there any more questions? Um, Are there? Okay, let me, let me take Nick's question. Okay, next. Okay, next. Next question is about the kili or the uh, tin. Sometimes there's silver coverings over an icon that covers all but the um, saint's face or a hand or um, a particular part of the body. Um, I, don't, I haven't done much research on that. I have seen many, many, many of these. Um, in fact, I was disappointed what, years ago when I went to Tinos because I wanted to see that original icon. I wanted at least a picture of it, but she's all totally covered. And um, that's an excellent question, but I really don't know too much about it. Um, no, I don't, I don't think that's exactly it. Okay, yes, it is. Yeah, okay, it is. But it's kind of printed, kind of yellow instead of silvery. But that's a good question, Nick. And how about you and I get together and research that? <laughs> well, I want to I wanna, uh, thank everyone who's online. And we're trying to keep our timeline if we can. And if you have more questions, you can on to see if I can hear them, but I think everybody online gave their questions. For those of you that are live streaming, thank you, thank you. We can't communicate with you, but we know you're there, so we appreciate that. And um, everybody here, thank you so much. And I'm oh, sorry. And like I said, the 28th will be the oratorical festival. We hope everyone will be here for that as well. Um, so there'll be a, a number of shorter speakers, but no less thought out, right? They do a great job. So, um, and then next month, Liz will be um, doing her seminar, God willing, she'll be able to come. So thank you again, and have a great day. Yeah.